Hello, Montgomery County, and welcome to Talking Ed Tech with MCIU. My name is Brandon Langer, and I am the Program Administrator for Instructional Technology in the Office of Organizational and Professional Learning. Uh, this Talking Ed Tech is our podcast to meet with product vendors, thought leaders in the space of educational technology, and see some you know, progress as to where we're going with technology, not just in a post-COVID world, but in a, in a future classroom world. As, as the educational landscape continues to shift, we continue to see our instructional practices evolve. And today we have an awesome opportunity to meet with a new PAIU partner, and that is a product called Formative, formerly GoFormative, if you were familiar with it in the past. But as you're going to see today, this product has come a long way since even I was introduced to it, uh, I don't know, probably six years, five years ago at this point. And we're so excited to have Cynthia and Brandon, uh, as well as some of my teammates on board, uh, to walk us through this awesome product and what they're hoping to do in educational classes. So welcome, Cynthia, and welcome, Brandon. Thank you. Glad to be here. I'm Cynthia Glover, the Director of Educational Partnerships at Formative. I'm a 30-year educator from the great state of Pennsylvania and a rabid Philadelphia Eagles fan. Hi, and I'm Brandon Shivers. I'm the Director of Learning and Development here at Formative. Um, I'm a 14-year career educator. Excited to be here to talk a little bit about formative practice and how might we engage you um, with how formative works and formative practice. Thank you. Awesome. Well, thank you both for joining us. And again, as I mentioned, we have two of, of, our, of my teammates joining us today, and that is Christy Ruth and Cassie Bruce. So I'll hand it over to Christy uh, to introduce herself and then over to Cassie to hear more about how they contribute to Montgomery County and uh, broader Pennsylvania projects. Hello, everyone. I'm Christy Ruth. I'm the program supervisor for the Montgomery Virtual Program, which is within the Office of Professional Learning at the Montgomery County IU. And MVP, the Montgomery Virtual Program, we partner with districts, um, with our district, Montgomery County, and with schools and districts throughout the state to provide virtual learning opportunities for their students. Hi, I'm Cassie Bruch. I'm a project consultant in the Office of Organizational and Professional Learning. I'm in Montgomery County, and I focus mostly on special education and instructional technology, um, some DEI work, work a lot with our special educators network here at the IU. Well, thank you all for joining us today. Uh, this is such a neat product, such a neat platform. And um, we've, we've talked a couple of times in our previous conversations, Brandon and Cynthia, just how it's it's fun to be in a product that not only has you know a good catchy name to it, but actually exemplifies that which the brand itself uh, you know, professes to, and that's what we're going to see a little bit today and what's exciting. Uh, so to kind of kick us off today, you know, Brandon or Cynthia, we're talking about formative both as a product, but then, but first, before we even go there, I mean, formative practices, formative assessments um, are, are continuing to be talked about as an important next step for classrooms. And this is not necessarily a new idea, but we continue to see it take hold as people are trying to approach, um, you know, things that we're calling learning loss, or we need to, you know, approach learning gaps, these type of, of terms. Formative assessment really is our path forward with that. And I'm just curious, you know, talking today, you know, both in the product realm, but also professionally, how does formative practices affect what you do uh, every day at this point? I think it affects a lot. When we think about like the first part of formative assessments, we thought about like the thumbs up, thumbs down. How are you feeling about this assignment? Leveling up, even tracking students for progress and how that's evolved in 10 years to be something more of like actionable data-based learning decisions. And really thinking about like, what are we teaching? Is it meeting the rigor of the standard? And how do we do it just in time to prevent the learning loss? So we know that we lost a lot in the past couple of years, but how do we meet them in that moment, kind of adjust just in time to really teach to the students in the room to make sure they have what they need versus waiting weeks or just saying like, do you, how do you feel about this lesson? More importantly, what do you know in this lesson and how do we govern what's happening in the classroom? Cynthia? Yeah, absolutely. I would plus one on to my good friend Brandon there. I mean, it's really about, uh, as Brandon said, meeting students in the moment. And it's also about, you know, giving teachers the tools they need in real time, you know, real time data that will impact real time instruction. I think in a perfect world, every teacher would be psychic. And we would know exactly where a student is hurt in that moment. In the reality, we don't. Uh, because we haven't had the tools for that immediate feedback and really the ability to close the feedback loop until formative. So absolutely, it's about meeting kids where they are and giving teachers the kind of resources they need to not only reflect, but to really modify their teaching uh, based on what that student needs right now at that second. 
Yeah, and it makes me think a lot, team, you know, the MCIU team about the work we've done with the virtual program and specifically Cassie and Christy have done a tremendous amount of resource building to support exactly what those students and parents needed, both through COVID, but even post COVID in our in our virtual environments. And and Cassie led a lot of that work. Cassie reminds me of our podcast around supporting students with disabilities in virtual environments and how we really broke that down. And so much of it comes down to those real time needs. Looking at the brand, looking at the product, looking at the, the platform that is formative. Um, how do you feel that this best translates that which we just said is so important, real-time data? How do we exemplify, uh, exemplify that in, in a virtual system, in a virtual setting? Yeah, so I, uh, the product kind of focuses more on the real-time feedback aspect. And so you're going to understand like how you agnostically teach and learn on a day-to-day -day basis. But more importantly, how do we meet students where they are? and then provide them with that feedback. So when we go in in a moment, you'll see that there's ways to do in-app communication real time. So the learner actually feels like in the moment, they are receiving the instruction and they are receiving the feedback and the guidance. So when we're guiding them different ways, either through a video or through like an infographic that you may have been teaching with, or even a screen share, like how many of us have had to go into Zoom or another platform Form, record something, download it, upload it somewhere else. Well, within our platform, you'll see in a moment, you're able to do that right there, turn key and give it to the student. And so you don't have to go in and like re-record stuff and bring it back down, but you can really kind of meet them where they are and really address their needs. And I think that's the biggest difference in other platforms is like, we're not just cookie cutter giving all this feedback, we're individualizing the instruction to make sure that it meets you as the learner where you're at and kind of moves you to where you need to be, whether it's grade level or college and career readiness or beyond life skills, thinking that way. Cynthia? Yeah, I would absolutely agree with Brandon. Again, you know, differentiation is, is embedded, it's baked into to, to, to formative. Um, and when you think about, you know, the kinds of things that other platforms offer, you know, streamlining ed tech is really the name of the game right now i mean since the pandemic there have probably been fifty thousand ed tech platforms available in fifty thousand different districts being used in fifty thousand different ways and i think what a lot of instructional technology leaders have been telling us is that now it's time to evaluate now it's time to figure out what do we need what works based on our budget our goals our timelines our objectives for our students uh, we actually had a fantastic webinar uh, not too long ago um, helping schools and districts with that that very concept of streamlining so we want to give teachers back time we want to give them a one-stop shopping location which is why you'll see as brandon demonstrates uh, that there are so many other aspects of other programs that are incorporated within formative. So I don't think most teachers have time to go to 20 different platforms to get what they need. It's better to have it in one space. So Brandon, this reminds me of the conversation that we've had since I started. It's that all of our learners are now virtual learners, whether they're sitting in a classroom all together or sitting at home. Um, so really thinking about the lens that I always look at is how is it accessible then to all of our learners? And I love the idea of being able to video record myself as a teacher to send it individually to the student who needs it at that time. Um, so what other ways is this, does formative make our learning accessible for all of our learners, whether we're talking about special ed or our multilingual learners and things like that? We have global accommodations, so any accommodation that you need that at the at the specific student level will be there embedded for you to turn on and turn off as needed. But then there's other features that's going to actively engage them. And so when we think about giving teachers the power in the platform, we're giving them the access to really take what they're teaching, kind of bring it to what they do and how they teach in, um, um, in their classroom and atmosphere but also thinking through like the engagement piece once again. So you'll see in one of examples I have for you a little bit later, a blended learning example where we can be teaching a lesson, I can pause it and then say, when you get to the listening center, I want you to justify. And so go back and I wanna hear from you. So that's an audio response question where we're asking the students to actually record the audio into the platform so I can hear exactly what they're thinking and their justification. Because we know all learners are not gonna type it all out, right? All learners are not gonna do the desired effect we want them to. We want them to get there, right? By the test, however, that's not the reality in the case. So if I just say, record this for me really quickly or send me an emoji, like explain it to me this way, then it has them in the moment really telling me what they know versus how they know it, right? And some kind of a fine balance between the two. 
Yeah, and I think Brandon, I think it's time to kind of go ahead and share screen here and and, and roll with what some of what you're describing because again, if you haven't been here before or, or haven't existed or seen what this platform can do and, and the way it maybe takes familiar approaches but executes it differently. And I think that's the part that stands out to me as as you as we take a look at your system, as we take a look at the experience, there's elements that you might find in other learning experience, teaching and learning tools. Um, but the way that formative has constructed it is just ever so slightly different and there, therefore the delivery is even, even a little bit different. So we're excited to hop in with you. Perfect. So I'm jumping in right now so you can kind of see where we're at. Um, and then I want to talk to you about what you see on the screen just quickly. Um, so on the screen, you're going to see teacher face mode. We see all of our participants are signed in as guest students, which is an option for you. So if you're doing anything like a parent night or any other thing or staff development as well, you can have them not rostered and in, in the moment as well. I'm also going to kind of govern what you see in real time as well. I'll switch back and forth between tabs. So you'll see this is the student experience. They see there's 13 questions. So the, the learners in the room are like, what's on this? How many is going to be? It's 13. We won't get through all 13 because I'm going to teach it through um, the demo as well. But also you'll be able to see kind of what it looks like in the edit form. That's the real time features as well. So I can change things in the moment and it automatically is syncing it. So my participants may say, where is the save button? There is no save button. It is web-based. And so you're going to, anytime you're typing something, you may see that circle move and it's going to edit it immediately on the screen. And then we'll get into the tracker and reports a little bit later. But let's go ahead and start this. We're going to start in three, two, one. And now your screens on the student page should change as well. So you'll see um, once you're in, it's going to update for you. And it should say, welcome to formative. So you see that circle moving? And you'll see a screen like this. And then I'm able to kind of govern what you see. So this could be your anchor screen for us as our mission control. And then I'm going to jump straight into the actual lesson. So we have a quote here from our founder. He talks about um, um, student achievement and learning through formative assessments. And so this is bit the big piece of this is that we are a for teachers by teachers company. And so when we think about learning and development, it happening in the moment, it's this piece right here, the powerful feedback to students that you're able to give in real time. And you'll see that as well through this. So thumbs up in the audience. Are you able to see what I'm presenting on your screen as well? Perfect. So everyone thumbs up. We can see it as well. And I know they're in it. And so right here, um, I just have this open-ended question. If you want to add anything, you can, and I'll be able to see you typing right here in, in this um, graph right here. But when we think about closing the feedback loop, that's what the product is designed to do. So in Pennsylvania, we know this models kind of what you all do when you're doing assessing and you're learning. But we think about instructing, assessing, engagement, and analyzing things, kind of seeing what's happening there. And so if I jump back here, I see someone wrote something. I'm able to click on that and I'm right into my dashboard. There we go. And now I see this. I'm also able to, let's go ahead and hide the names. And then I can go up here. I'm going to randomize them. So they've been shuffled again. And now we can see what's happening here. And this is a free response question. So I can click on any of this. Looks familiar to this. Type on this. I could quickly grade the student here. And this is the power of feedback. And so you'll see when we talked about it earlier, I can record audio to this particular learner in the room and give them feedback there. I can embed anything. There's those emojis we talked about, right? If there's an image on my desktop, I can upload it and send it right to you. I also have the math feature. So this is really neat because often when I taught fourth grade, I would say like, carrot means this, or this means that, like when I'm writing out things for math, it's all right here. So if you're a math teacher, you can go ahead and add the math in automatically. And then you can record that video. So right here, you have the option to record the video. You can also search YouTube or anything on Google and it's gonna sanitize it, which means there'll be no commercials. There'll be none of that happening right there. So you can kind of think about like what you're gonna do with the feedback, but I could literally just type, um, thank you for sharing. And then it's sent to the student or the learner right there. They have it. If you're in your formative now, you can actually type back to me if you click on your little bubble on your screen um, here, it should pop up for you and you're able to go ahead and type back to me um, and give me some feedback. So if you want to like say, I don't understand this, I don't understand. It's been sent to me and you'll see this has been sent to me. I see two of these popping up for me right here on the screen. My notifications are on. I also have the option as a learner as well to do the same thing my instructor is doing with me, right? They can provide audio back to me 
um, they can have the emoji here. They can add the math, video files, and everything. And you'll see I'm already getting feedback from a lot of the learners in the room. So if I hop back over here, I see now I have information coming in. So I can record. I need help. And so then I may challenge them to say, what do you need help with? Or I can, if they tell me they're missing something from notes, I can upload it right there in the moment. So looking at any of those pieces as well. Thoughts as you kind of see what's happening here informative. Brandon, I saw that you can do um, feedback to the individual students. Can you do feedback to the entire group? Could you push one thing mm -hmm. to everyone? Thank you for asking that because often we might all have the same correct answer. So now I've selected these four students, I could select all if it was all of them, and I could type back feedback here. I could just, I'm going to just give you all an emoji really quick. Um, let me just give you the thumbs up, which I don't have a problem. I can't, there it is in the corner. And then now all the students got this. And like we said, we're all virtual learners. So for all virtual learners right now, you feel like I probably gave you individualized feedback, right? But because you had consistently the same type of answers, I'm able to provide the same feedback to multiple learners at the same time. And hopefully you feel special in the room. Um, and you feel like, oh, the teacher's talking just to me. Um, but you don't know behind the curtain, I'm talking to four of you all at one time. So really making it digestible for the teacher as well. When we think about putting in feedback, like how many times you had to grade a paper or anything like that and have to like fill it out over and over and over again. You're like, I wish I had a stamp, right? Um, but if you're typing the same feedback or the same redirection, I can select multiple at one time and give them the same redirection if that's needed as well. It also makes me think about how quick I could intervene if I see three kids going down the wrong type of path in terms of maybe a math question, right? And they all did the same wrong step or, or you know, anything, maybe a lab. I'm seeing, you know, people do practice problems and they're, they're going on the wrong. I could quickly provide the intervention support, the video, the, and it doesn't just have to be me saying, whoa, 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 stop, you know, but come over. It, I can I can push people diverse resources and intervene in that learning in the moment. And that is a, a huge tenant to me when you guys talk about real time. Uh, data, real-time support, we're not just talking about a number, a grade, we're talking about the the reporting on the data currently unfold, the learning unfolding in front of us and the ability to, to, to supplement that. I'm also wondering with that, if I see like a group of like three or four learners that need a little extra support. So is there a way I can like group them and send them to a different part of the lesson or like an older lesson to review something that we went over or if a group was absent, can I quickly like put them, you know, over here so they can catch up on this and then join us back in? Yeah. So what I've done and, and not on this account, but a different account, I've been able to put them in separate groups. So like I have a, a demo group where they're like all these kids who I know are in like my, I think about like blended learning. They're all in group one. So maybe they're the Snickers if you teach elementary school or they're the blue group if you teach middle school. Right. Um, and so they're in this group and I've labeled them that and I'm able to kind of push out assignments to them individually and they know what's happening. That's a great segue as well um, to down here. If I jump to this ex experience, which is our student experience, you'll see this question now populated for you. So it's the same idea there. So where I can take a look and say, we taught mood. So in a moment, you're going to go in, you're going to underline what is mood to you. So um, show your work, underline words that create mood in this passage. And so if I jump over to this question, jump to this question, uh, oh, no. There we go. Um, if anyone clicks in the show your work box, it's going to automatically populate. And now I'm going to be able to see you annotate in real time on the actual screen. And if I see something that's going on that doesn't make sense to me, I can either tag it and then reteach re, uh, re it later, or I could push out things in the chat to you. Or when you go to independent learning, I can then submit an ass assignment to you because you're already grouped. And so that group of Snickers or that blue group, I can now send them all a redirection here. Um, you'll see here comes the real-time annotations. And then you'll also notice this is a yes and question. So as I'm teaching and reviewing mood here, I can say to you, explain your thinking when you get to that listening center, right? And so now you'll see this is a forced audio um, question and you're gonna have to record some type of audio explaining why you actually um, highlighted those words and that's that voice and choice right hearing from the learner in real time in the actual room or later i also have the option to delay the feedback so maybe i'm seeing some things right 
And often, and I'm guilty of this when I was in the classroom, I want to teach it right now. Like I got to stop it because there's two kids raise their hand and have a question on this. But if I'm looking at the data once again, and I'm noticing that it's only like one or two of you that have misconceptions, there's no need for me to stop the whole lesson, right? And reteach to the 20 when only two misunderstood it and they raised their hand, but I see it informative. I can redirect them later and keep the lesson moving um, versus having to say like, oh, two people raised their hand and now the whole class doesn't understand, right? When I'm looking at data like this and I'm understanding what's happening, I can then in real time say, make that decision. Is it something I need to stop and reteach or is it something I'm going to push out later to a certain select group of students? Cynthia, you wanna add something? Yeah, I, everything that you're saying, Brandon, makes me think about students owning their learning. You know, mm -hmm. students are not um, blank slates. You know, I, I think about Paulo Freire, who talked about in the pedagogy of the oppressed in the late 60s that, you know, there's this kind of banking system of education that we knew historically where teachers simply made deposits into students. And the students were supposed to receive those deposits. But teachers, are, you know, students are dynamic individuals. They're people, right? They don't come to us absent of some type of knowledge. So it's not just meeting them in the moment, but also acknowledging the kind of pre-knowledge that they bring, but also helping them to own that learning and really be engaged in their own uh, educational process. Um, thank you. Because I'm also thinking about that learning as well. If I pause this screen, what happened to my learners in the audience? What happened on your screens? Anything? We were alerted that our teacher has paused and that you will resume the session. Yeah. And so now your screens went white and blank, hopefully. And now if I need to redirect, so say we all don't understand mood right now and I need to reteach mood. I've now paused the learning experience individually for you. And I'm going to be able to reteach it either in my virtual session or live in the classroom, right? On the board, if I'm projecting it. And I'm able to go in and say, so when we think about mood, what words resonate with mood? You can use your word wall in the room. You can use your notes. Like, let's rethink this because now 90% of you all don't understand mood. And now it's time to stop and readjust the learning right there versus waiting for later. Um, so you have those two different experiences as well um, inside of here. And then another quick feature I wanted to show you is my favorite teacher. Uh, oops, I jumped to the wrong slide. Miss Smith. And I want you to really think about the Miss Smith that you have. So this is Grandma's Secret. So Miss Smith is my favorite because she loves Grandma's Secret. It's her favorite story. So you can tell it's probably from the basil. Um, but what she's done is she's actually scanned it in the formative because it's from 1998. Ooh. Um, but the content is not bad, right? If we think about like literature and things, those things live on forever. The questions from 1998 may not be what we're doing in 2022. So she's able to still keep her content that she loves the story, Grandma's Secret. But you can now see we can use the setting. And now she can go in and say, I want you to use this type of diagram, our graphic organizer, to organize your setting. I also want to hear from you. So you can see this. She says, I want to hear you being fluent readers. And so no longer is she having to pull the kids to the table, individually listen to them read and track it. She can do it right here in the app as well. So it gives a lot of flexibility depending on the learning style. And then you take Miss Jones. She says, I don't even want to do that. I like sleep with the brain. And so you can hear her actually giving instructions. You're going to read an article called Sleep and the Brain. When you are finished, answer the four questions that follow. And she did the same thing that kind of Miss Smith did. She liked these from the passage. She quickly took the PDF and added the questions, took two seconds, but she also made it more rigorous by addressing the needs of the standards and thinking about how to really adjust this to from 1998 to 2022 and 23. Like, how do we make that pivot um, with literature that we actually love and we actually feel like met a moment and I love the story, but I wanted to meet the moment and the rigor of the standards. Um, so I'm wondering, as I'm seeing some of these like question types that come through, are there ways to put like additional accommodations in for students? So if a student has less answer choices, as one of their SDIs, is that, are you able to like tag kids to put it in? So then as they are going through some of these, it's automatic. I love that I can respond in different ways and there's different tools and stuff I was playing around with, but just thinking about that from the teacher side. So 
like a sneak preview for 2023. That's actually coming out next in the next few months. We have strike through options. We have other options. So when we think about teaching and learning, like slash in the trash, or even if you have the combination where you eliminate answer choices, you're now able to go, well, you will be able to go to in and do that um, in the next couple of upcoming updates. So we survey the audience often, like the teachers, the learners, and the students as well, and kind of understand what their needs are quick little story about, I live in Georgia. Um, and so we went to a school and we were thinking about more gamification features here. And one of the learners said, I actually love formative because it's not noisy. There's some other things I'm doing when there's too much noise. And I have, a, she told me I have ADHD, I have all these things going on and I get so distracted on other apps that are playing music or there's all these things moving. And she says, I actually like it because it's clean and I, I know what to do and I get out. Um, so you'll see there, we have a little, some confetti and things that will help, help celebrate students but they kind of listen, we listen to them and said, well, maybe we don't need a lot of music. I mean, we don't need these things that we thought we might want because some competitors may have it, right? However, if we listen to the students and the teachers, they're saying, that's not a need for us. A need is strike through, right? Slash the trash. Can you make that work for us? Um, and so then that's kind of how our roadmap is built. But yes, we have a very aggressive product development team that listens um, and supports the actual app development as well. So you name it, they will build it. That's awesome. Okay. So then my other question to that is any like picture dictionaries or translation tools that are available for students who might need them? So uh, we don't have a picture dictionary yet, but we do have translation tools built into the program. There's Spanish already built in. However, it is HTML5. It is web-based. So I don't work for Google. I'm not going to talk about Google Translate in detail, but I will tell you because it is HTML5, you can put in your Google Translate add-on and it will translate the whole page, not the screenshots, of course. Come on, y'all. Um, it will only be the words on the page. Um, so anything that's on the actual screen, um, it will translate it to that, that the, the home language of the learner that's built into Google Translate. Okay, perfect. Now I'm going to put you on the spot one more time. Oh, Thinking yeah. about <laughs> Brandon's laughing because this is what I do. Students who use like screen readers and stuff, is it easy to put like alt text in for the images? So students have access to mm -hmm. graphics and images that we're posting on here as well. Yes. Um, Texas used something called Snap Read It. Um, and they actually used it all over. So we were in Texas and they were like, we love it because we can add in our accommodations that we've already purchased through another vendor, I guess. And it layered right on top of Formative, like a transparency. And they were able to read the things that Formative won't read. But we do have text-to-speech that will read any of the questions that are actually typed out. Um, so like this, it won't read because that's an actual like PDF, right? But it would read A, B, C, and D. The, if the teacher or facilitator typed the question out, it would read it over here for them. Um, but this is just a quick ad example. I love it. Any more questions? Come on. Then on a different note, so thinking about like students in their LMSs, how easy does this sync over so students aren't like opening one thing to another to another and get distracted as they do that? How seamless is that integration? Yeah, the integration is, I'm, I'm sorry, the integration no, is seamless. Um, we are agnostic to any LMS or SIS. We work with the existing technology within the school or district. So there's nothing that you have to change from a technology perspective. We can weave ourselves within to that. We also have a lockdown browser in the form of Respondus, which is very different from other lockdown browsers because we can actually stop kids from going to any other place on the internet until they have completed that formative assignment. And what I love about Respondus, just really quick, is that um, I used to teach in Florida. And so in Florida, we would like do mock testing, like the state test, we tried to mock it, but we could never mock it the way it actually was. With respondents and all that is that is same exact experience. They log into the, their computer like they're logging into the state assessment. Everything's locked down. It gives them a true picture of what that moment in time will feel like. Um, and more importantly, in elementary school for third grade, it was the first time they ever took it. So anytime we could mirror what that experience could be like, we could relieve some of the stress that they knew that was coming on the state assessment in like May. Um, so that's the really neat thing about, I think, respondents really mirrors kind of what your state assessment would feel like, um, but it also keeps them from going other places as well. And a quick yes and on the respondents thing that's already built in the program is that if you want, if, and let me jump to a different question, I want you to go to the internet and I want you to go ahead and copy anything you want from the internet and drop it into a question. Let me jump up here. I'm going to jump to, I think this one will work. Go back to this question. You can open it back up and just copy anything from the internet and see what happens. So you're going to just like copy something from me, drop it in there. Um, 
and you're going to see the power of what's already built into the tool as well. So if you think Respondus is great, this is already embedded. Look, this is this has an exclamation point next to it. Why? Well, it's telling me, all right, that's me. This response was copied from the internet. It tells us where, right? Um, and so it's just like a turn it in experience, but if students are pulling things from the internet and just trying to drop answers in, it's gonna alert the teacher that you've copied and pasted things from another part of the actual internet. Um, so that's another neat feature. I think the kind of security feature that's kind of built into the platform to know that I'm getting authentic answers from the learner and not from the internet. And now putting on my middle school teacher hat, does it pick up if I, like Christy and I copied and pasted the same thing it looked like because we were probably on that same site earlier. Um, but what if we had posted the same thing but didn't copy it from the internet if I just copied her answer? Oh, I don't think it checks for that. Okay. Um, but it depends on how you're doing the actual learning. And so I always think desired effects. So there's mm -hmm. a couple of things that would be happening here. Um, you should notice that um, when I go to assign, actually, let me go here. Um, and so you can see what's happening under my assigned settings. So at this point, you can't make any visible edits. Um, I'm not going to return your scores. I'm not going to return your answers. I could do them after you submit. I could do them when they're closed. All those features are kind of embedded as well. Um, but I think about middle and high school. So if I'm teaching first period, it's the same thing. I'm not returning answers at all, right? I will return it after we finish grading it and discussing it because I don't want fourth period to get 100 on the assessment that I'm giving. So thinking about whatever you're trying to do in the lesson, like for the example on the board, we're teaching and learning in the platform right now. So I may want answers to be returned because I want to be reteach and I'm okay with seeing everything turn blue and correct, right? Because I would know that we're you're paying attention versus if it's a sit down, let's take an assessment and let's do it like to make sure you understand the content. I'm not, I'm going to change my settings as well. So hopefully they're not sharing and copying answers because they shouldn't be communicating within the assessment block. And we can also randomize the order of various things informative as well. Uh, so that, you know, Bobby can't see exactly what Sarah's doing. I, I think as we've we've hit a number of different things here in, in our, you know, 10 to 15 minutes that we've been looking through the platform, the part that stands out to me is the adaptability and a conversation, again, Cynthia and Brandon, that we had, you know, prior to recording today was just about a, a true teaching and learning solution. And with that, um, many promised that. But many also are teaching and solu learning solution as they, the company, have defined that. What seems right. like you guys have, have, have at your disposal and, and the company is providing is something that's actually adaptable to the human, the teacher. And I think that might be a part where teachers feel uh, um, ostracized by technology. They, they, not that they're replaced by it, but that it's forcing them to do things the way they, 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 they aren't necessarily even the best at what they do doing it that way. I love the example, Brandon, you're the first one to ever do it for me, to show me someone using a 20-year-old resource in a modern platform. And that seems so simple. That seems like such a simple thing because you made a great point when you're describing it. It's not that the practices of 20 years ago are being deployed. It's that the content is the content. We have that conversation in our office all the time about content. I, I just think that, that that's a great point. Not that you know we couldn't do that in other things, but you have shown us time and time again through a couple of different things. And, and I'm just so happy to see Cassie question, ask a million questions of somebody else other than me for once. Um, albeit another Brandon, but it, it still worked really well. Um, but anyway, I just think it's been so fun to see a, a toolkit that is not just robust in the way that you envision, but robust in a way that probably a lot of teachers would feel at home or, or learn to be at home here rather than feeling like it's going to be a huge lift. And just one quick thing, just to show you like one report because you're talking about you govern things. And so our standards progress report, if we run it, you're able to set your own standards. So think about what's happening in your state and really think about, I can see I'm trending on the reading standards up, these math ones were trending down. Um, but if I think about what's happening in my state and craft and structure, if I look at this report, I'm able to see when I gave it, but I can set the actual reference line. So depending on my school, my district, for my whole area, I can set the standard. So maybe Pennsylvania says 70 is passing. So, you know, the middle one we didn't do well on. But at my site, they're saying, no, not 70 at this site, it's 85. And so now you can kind of see really quickly visually on the teacher and the student lens 
how the teaching and learning happens with the data at this point, because I'm able to progress monitor based off of whatever reference line I want to set um, in either my room, my PLC, my, my school, my district, or the state. I get a lot of questions about reporting and analytics, so thank you for showing that. Um, and then my other question I get a lot about, Brandon, is uh, in a different lens, but is content. What does content look like informative? What, what What's available to people out in the wild? So we have our formative library, which is kind of, um, it's teacher driven. So you'll see when I click on anything that has this formative logo, it means it's been verified by formative. But just like any other platform or curriculum that you're using, you want to make sure it meets your needs. Like, is what's been put here the way you teach? And so you can see embedded things in the YouTube videos that are that this woman's teaching. I was doing a multiplication practice session the other day, and you kind of see what's happening. But I also have the bundle here, and I can kind of see what's happening in the bundle. I could do anything that's aligned to different states as well. And I'll let Cynthia speak about our item banks as well, because that's a new feature for us and kind of how that is also content you can bring in. But there's one thing that's different than everyone else. Cynthia? It is. And, and, and the great thing I like about the library, just one more point about that, is you can create your own library within your own district or school. And we're trying to give educators as much autonomy as possible. And yet, our wonderful new item banks, we're extremely excited about that. Um, this was something that many people had asked us for over the years. And we have partnered with an organization that will allow us to do that. And, and so one of the great things about our uh, item bank is that you can make edits. It is editable. Amazing, right? So that, again, teachers are not forced to use what's already created for them. They can make edits in an actual item bank. And that's for math, English, science, and social studies. And that's a wonderful add-on. I like that. I like that. That gives teachers the autonomy and they can tweak things how they want and share. So if Christy and I are teaching the same lesson, most of it stays the same, but we might make a couple different tweaks based on our classes. Um, and so one of the things that I liked as you went through kind of the library that you had is I saw a lot of secondary content, which I do feel like some other platforms that I've looked at before gear more towards elementary. So I did want to call that out. I did see more secondary content than I was expecting, to be honest. And now thinking of that, um, I know out Christie's direction, they went virtual today because it's icy out. I was lucky my my daughter's off to school today. Um, but we do know that that's going to happen as we're coming into winter. Um, and now we have all these virtual platforms and tools that we can use. How easy is it me for me as a teacher if my district calls me at 6 a.m.? Virtual learning day, whether it's synchronous or asynchronous, how easy is it to tweak my plan informative so I can switch to a snow virtual day? I think it's just the same lesson. Uh, the difference is I'm teaching it from home. And so what I've done with this presentation, I've done it in person several times as well. And so we can do it in the room, but I've made a few tweaks and now we're doing it virtually on a Zoom or on Teams or whatever your choice platform is. Um, so it's just, there's really no change. Students will, it'll actually appear on their dashboard like always. You would just encourage them, okay, everyone cameras on, whatever your, your routine for virtual learning is, but the learning experience would be the same, that stop and start I love, right? Because it paused your screen. So that's very powerful when they're home, right? And they're still trying to answer questions or do things ahead of time, like stop, everyone focus on me. Um, I've done a couple of virtual teaching. I'm like, hands on ears. Let's listen to the beat. It's Mr. Shiver. <laughs> so I see everyone's hands up here and I know they're not typing. They're following me and they're looking around and saying like, this is mood, right? Or this is cause and effect. So I'm going to release this assignment again and let's redo it again. Um, so it should just be the same common practice. You're just going to do your virtual engagement things you would normally do, but the content and the lesson shouldn't have to change at all, actually. You all are asking fantastic questions, by the way. I'm absolutely blown away by the questions. <laughs> well, we, I, I said I said before we started, right? I got the best team here, so I I uh, fully knew fully knew that we we'd have a great conversation. And uh, to kind of guide us toward the end here, I, I Brandon, thank you for the thorough walkthrough. And, and I, I know that we could have gone so much deeper. I mean, that your item banks, your your question types, you know, all that kind of stuff is is very deep. Um, but we I. I feel even personally, having only had multiple conversations, every time we've had one, I've, I come across something more unique and, and different every time. Um, Cynthia, it's been a great fall for us because we've not only gotten to know each other and uh, you know spar about football alli alliances here, but we've also gotten to uh, launch a partnership with PAIU. So all your intermediate, intermediate units across Pennsylvania have the opportunity uh, to sign on and offer statewide pricing. 
Um, so Cynthia, anything you want to add on there? I'm going to drop your email into the bottom of the video here so they can get and reach out to you directly because you're our contact for Pennsylvania. But anything about you want to share about uh, that new partnership? Yeah, absolutely. And thanks to you, Brandon, uh, for, you know, facilitating that partnership even happening. Yes, we have a brand new uh, hot off the presses partnership between Formative and PAIU, uh, which incorporates all of the districts within every IU in the state. And I am the point of contact and we are offering a, a discounted pricing. And more importantly, we've made a commitment as an organization um, to help the students who I love the most from my home state. Maybe I shouldn't say that, but I told you I was a Rabbit Eagles fan, but it's always great when you come home, right? You can come home with something that's really going to help the kids that are in your neighborhood, your community. And so, yes, we're very proud of that partnership. Uh, we've had a, a very wonderful time getting to know PAIU and the PAMES Committee. And uh, we are very excited to bring this powerful resource um, to people who I think will not only um, see the value of it, but, you know, who remind me very much of what a, a great state Pennsylvania is. Absolutely. Well, it has been wonderful to chat with all of you today. And once again, you know, here's Cynthia's contact info. Here's my contact info. If you have any questions, uh, please feel free to reach out. Uh, she's extremely quick to respond. She might even beat me, which is which is a tough act to follow sometimes because I feel like I live in email. But thank you, Cynthia. Thank you, Brandon. Thank you, Cassie. Thank you, Christy, uh, for joining today's conversation model. It helps to kind of see multiple angles, Brandon. You know, with multiple responses, and and you know, you, we always talk about these things, but someone's like, ah, does it really work that way? But even to Cassie's point about pivoting to virtual learning. We did this virtually. We didn't, I mean, we knew it would be recorded, but you, you to your point, you've used this lesson before live and, and online. So um, thank you all for, for hopping on. And if this is your first one, we do have a whole series of these talking ed tech videos. Uh, please feel free to check out our playlist. Please feel, please feel free to reach out. If uh, you are a product provider or a thought leader in the space of ed tech, we'd love to talk ed tech with you and we will see you all next time. Thank you.